welcome to this lecture on Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. In today's lecture, I'm going to talk about the plot of this uh, novel. If you remember the previous lecture, we understand uh, the purpose of Mary Shelley in uh, producing this Gothic tale. Uh, her objective uh, in this tale uh, is to relate this particular novel, Frankenstein, to a class of fiction called the Gothic. So this um, Frankenstein belongs to the genre of the Gothic and that is a, a self-consciousness uh, on the part of Shelley while structuring and uh, writing this uh, fiction. And the prime no motive, um, we should uh, always remember, the prime motive is uh, uh, to uh, exploit, exploit every human being's um, capacity for fear, the capacity to sense, suspense, and horror. So uh, this is a gothic tale, and the purpose of the gothic tale is to provoke fear, suspense, and horror. So uh, using this formula, um, Mary Shelley produces an uh, exciting and excellent work which is uh, very very subtle and produces a range of effects which cannot be neatly categorized into one type of uh, literary piece. Uh, in fact uh, the success of the novel rests in the fact that um, this novel uh, has uh, multiple perspectives depending on the uh, lens that we use to read this fiction. This uh, novel, Frankenstein, was written in the form of letters, uh, and uh, since it's uh, epistolary, it also offers um, the chance uh, for the writer to bring in several different points of view, which means that um, the reader learns to see events in complex ways and not always from the same angle as the narrator. So it is uh, also probably, we should remember, that the first uh, ever science fiction uh, work too. So uh, it is an epistolary work. Uh, it is in the form of letters and the and the purpose of using this kind of uh, narrating technique uh, is to allow uh, multiple points of view um, and it has an advantage over the third person um, you know uh, lens because the third person we do get only the um, only the viewpoint of the narrator. So here we get uh, the viewpoints of several uh, characters uh, from their own uh, points of view. So these are some of the implications of using the uh, epistolary mapper. And we, we need to understand that this story is primarily uh, told in the form of letters written by Captain Robert Walton to his sister Margaret. And um, along the way, uh, the narrative uh, switches to Victor Frankenstein, who himself uh, begins to tell from his own point of view. So there are several eyes here because of the nature of um, epistolary style. In Gothic novels, this kind of framed narrative or, or this kind of multiple points of view where lots of people tell their tales, tell their stories through letters can also be termed as nesting. Um, so stories are uh, embedded within stories and in, in every story, a particular character relates their uh, story. So this is called nesting, and it is a very important uh, technique in Gothic uh, fiction. And nesting creates um, both uh, multiple points of view, and at the same time, there is a kind of a distancing effect. So uh, the story seems to change, uh, and there seems to be no one objective uh, kind of reality as well in this kind of um, structure of nesting. So it's it's distanced, and 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 the you know the objectivity keeps shifting from one figure to the other. So what's the story? So uh, the story is told by Robert Walton primarily, and he's en route to the North Pole to find the Northwestern Sea Passage. And while he's traveling, uh, Walton rescues uh, Victor, Victor Frankenstein from the ice. And uh, Victor recalls his happy youth. Uh, he uh, tells Walden about his childhood, uh, about his youth in Geneva uh, with his family and his friend Henry Clarewall. So uh, you get to know about Victor through the eyes of uh, Walden uh, in a letter that he writes to his sister Margaret. So that's the premise. So 
Victor also tells uh, Walton about his uh, student days um, at the University of Ingolstadt and uh, where, where the student, where this, um, you know, where the student who is interested in science and um, experiments, he embarks on uh, a range of innovative, unique, uh, uh, novel uh, scientific experiments to discover that secret of life, the principle of life, and he hopes to produce a living creature from uh, body parts. So th that kind of story is given to us through uh, uh, Walton, who he hears the story from Victor Frankenstein. So, uh, if you if you kind of look at the story, you you will be reminded of the previous discussions that we had uh, about how Mary Shelley um, came upon this idea of uh, you know uh, reproducing the spark of life. If you think about the Gothic context and the Gothic uh, you know uh, story writing contest um, that was held uh, uh, amongst her friends, so we we kind of understand that all those discussions uh, went into the making of this particular kind of storyline. When Victor is experimenting, uh, he is in fact meddling with science. Um, so he is meddling with the deepest secrets of nature uh, and of life processes. And this kind of meddling has tragic consequences. He does achieve his aim. He is successful in uh, kind of uh, finding, discovering that spark of life which gives birth to this monster. He is able to recreate life, uh, put together life um, in, in this novel way from various body parts. And he creates this uh, new human being but he's horror stricken at the outcome because it's it's a monster that he has birthed that he has produced and um he kind of rejects the uh, rejects the creature uh and and runs away and eventually the creature also goes missing so certainly when um you know, Victor gets to hear about the death of his brother, William. He realizes that who is um, behind the death of his uh, brother and uh, Victor becomes extremely guilty because someone else um, is, is kind of, you know, accused for the crime of murdering uh, Victor's uh, brother and that person is also put to death. Um, that's Justine Moritz and she is very innocent uh, of this crime. So you can see how, uh, you know, Victor becomes uh, massively responsible for the deaths of innocent lives. The creature is very, very lonely um, th because there is nobody else like him and he laments that fact and um, the, the monster's words are poignant. It's very heart, uh, heartbreaking when he when he kind of wants to be loved, seeks to be loved and uh, there's this argument that he is not perhaps innately evil, he's not a really a monster, he's not born a monster but he has been turned into one and uh, in fact the people whom he tries to help also kind of reject him when they come to know who the uh, um, actual helper is the delays family they react with terror and loathing and he's desperate to have a family of his own so that kind of desperation for companionship is uh, kind of uh, heartrending so we, you can kind of sense that uh, this creature is depicted as an innocent victim who becomes dangerous, who becomes uh, really, uh, you know, a, a threat to the security of human beings after he has been rejected, not only by his maker, but by society uh, as well, the society with whom he tries to kind of relate in, in some ways. And he declares that, uh, the monster declares that I am malicious uh, because I am miserable. And he pleads with Victor uh, at one point to fashion a mate for him, to create a female for him he wants his own eve so um you know this kind of um uh, situation of the monster is something that is created by victor and and you know uh, this creature didn't ask uh, to be made and if you can uh, go back to the title page of this um, novel uh, Frankenstein you can um, remember those lines which have been used by Shelley on the title page in which we, we, we see the lines which have been um, you know spoken by Adam Adam who didn't want to be made so so that similarity between the two are uh, very very uh, striking and, and it's kind of uh, provoked and uh, evoked in the story uh, through through such moments and this 
desire for a domesticity and companionship is something uh, which is very significant and it seems to argue the novel seems to argue that uh, you know if one is cut off from such kind of bond such relationships then that person would turn into an evil so frankenstein's monster mentions that you know uh, states that i have heard of all the various relationships which bind one human being to another in mutual bonds i have come to know of all this and it's very interesting that the monster is self-taught he gets all the books he reads everything he reads paradise law so it, it's very very um significant that you know uh, domesticity is a key to one's uh, good sense of righteousness wants a morality and all those um elements which which kind of uh, keep you uh, sane and happy and healthy so uh, he wants that the creature wants that and he says that i have never yet seen a being resembling me uh, who or who claimed any in intercourse with me what was i so um, he says that i i can't see anybody mirroring me anybody resembling me and nobody is keen to have any kind of conversation with me any kind of relationship with me what exactly am i so these are the questions um that kind of create a, a lot of poignancy in the novel with relation to this creature when victor frankenstein hears the agony of um this monster that he had created uh, he kind of uh, agrees uh, to create the female companion desired by um, his monster and uh, he tries to make such a creature and he's nearly on the verge of giving life to this uh, female um, monster when he kind of has a second uh, thoughts about it he's suddenly worried uh, as to the consequences of th what this creation would um, mean for humanity so what he does he immediately um, puts an end to that female uh, monster he kills her uh, in front of the monster's eyes in fact the m monster is watching uh, this creation uh, from outside um, you know through the windows and he's ecstatic he's happy he's grinning in a frightening manner and that's when uh victor decides okay um this is not a great idea and he puts an end to the female monster and this uh, makes this act makes the monster go insane and uh, you know several terrible consequences ensue for um victor his friend is killed um you know henry is killed and uh, and frankenstein is accused of his murder and thrown into prison for a while and frankenstein becomes seriously ill and um later on when he recovers when he's uh, cleared of the crime he uh, marries uh, elizabeth and um the wife is killed by the monster as well and um the father dies of grief uh, victor's father dies of grief so all these terrible consequences ensue um because of that uh, act of uh, victor of killing that female uh, 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 the company that um the, the creature that uh, the monster desired uh, above anything else so you can see the the there is a kind of a repetition of horror or, or on horror uh, because of that one event uh, of bringing to life um, you know the dead uh, from various body parts so victor decides to have his vengeance and he pursues the monster um, you know across the arctic ways and he and he kind of uh, chases after him and at one point he's near to kind of um you know uh meeting him when when the the kind of the ice shell floats away and he is unable to get to that uh monster so uh at this point he is terribly um you know fatigued he's exhausted and he has been uh and he's rescued by robert walton who is on this arctic expedition and uh he takes him into his ship and, and kind of gives him suck and that's how uh, Victor narrates the tale to Robert Walton who in turn narrates it to his sister uh, at home so th that's how the story has been uh, set up but eventually uh, Victor dies um, exhausted he dies and uh, uh, at, um, when, he, when he's dead the, the creature returns and mourns over the body of uh, uh, his creator his father that's how he calls him and he's extremely uh, remorseful and, and he 
he he says that he from now on there's a uh, new further uh, pursuit in life for him uh, and he is going to kill himself he is isolated he's extremely remorseful and he kind of leaves to face his own fate and and we kind of uh, realize that um you know he intends to uh, kill himself on a, on a um, funeral pyre uh, on the arctic now if we think about the creature um it's it's very bizarre it's horrid looking um it's not uh, very uh pleasing to look at i mean how would it be pleasing because that uh, body has been put together by discarded uh, um uh, you know uh, body uh, hearts and and this creates a lot of gothic effect you know it's revolting that the horror is there um so it also connects him to other very horrifying uh, uh gothic uh figures you know such as you know Hyde for example uh, in uh, R L Stevenson's the strange case of Dr Jekyll and uh, Mr Hyde so even though that gothic effect is there um, there is an element of vulnerability and pathos uh, that the creature uh, evokes um, the creature is um, doubt uh, without any doubt uh, really frightening and it does kill a lot of people it murders a lot of people it destroys families and and all these you know uh gory crimes have been done by him yet he kind of evokes a lot of um sympathy from um the readers because of his language he speaks in a very very powerful potent uh, emotion driven uh, language and um we can see that you know the 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 narrative that uh, the creature gives of his uh, wanderings uh, you know the way he spends his time make him appear vulnerable to the bombardment of sensations that greet him because uh, wherever he goes everything is new to him he's like a child who has come into this world for the first time and and he's kind of finding his way um however you know there's there's a contrast between how the frankenstein uh, uh monster you know depicts himself uh and the way frankenstein sees uh, his his own creature you know the creature that he has created so there's a difference between the two narratives the narratives of the creature uh, about his own life and Victor's narrative about the creature he kind of sees the creature as horrific as very dangerous potentially dangerous and he describes him as the wretch and and he um terms him as horridly different to the rest of the human beings in this world and um, when when uh, when the creature kind of stretches out one hand uh, you know is reaching out um reaching out to kind of meet his maker to kind of uh, relate to his maker the creator uh, frankenstein kind of recoils and um we we kind of sense that you know uh, there is a vulnerable there's a fearfulness within the creature and he seems a uh, harmless but despite um you know his vulnerability the rejections the constant rejections uh, the alienations um from society the way he has been cut off very very brutally from the world kind of makes him troubled tormented half frightened and um, monstrous um you know ultimately now let's look at the women characters in the novel very very quickly uh, the most important one is elizabeth uh, who is the step step sister and betrothed of victor in the 1818 edition she is um described as a distant cousin to victor and in the 1831 edition she is uh, revised uh, and and referred to as the sister um you know who have been adopted by victor's uh, mother uh, an adopted sister um so uh, you know you, you can see some minor revisions going on in relation to this uh, particular character elizabeth so the relative becomes um you know uh, uh, an impoverished uh, child from a peasant family in italy who uh, has been adopted by uh, victor's mother caroline so that's um elizabeth's um context and she marries um vector and on the wedding day she is also killed by uh, the monster victor frankenstein expects the monster to come for him uh, but um you know to his surprise it it goes to elizabeth and destroys her so you can see how that uh, you know the heterosexual family unit is destroyed by this creature um and and it presents a potent threat to 
a kind of a happy domesticity because its own domesticity is thwarted. So it's revenge, a perfect revenge uh, enacted by uh, the creature on his maker. You know, his uh, the creature's desire for uh, a mate was uh, destroyed by um, Victor, uh, you know, his father um, and the symbolic father. And he kind of repeats, uh, he kind of does the same thing uh, and, and wreaks vengeance on, on Victor by destroying his, uh, you know, incipient domesticity by, by killing um, his wife, Elizabeth. Now let's talk about the idea of the female gothic. Ellen Morris was the first uh, critic to kind of um, define the idea of the female gothic in her uh, New York Review of Books in 1974. And she placed Anne Radcliffe at the heart of her definition of female gothic gothic um, and and she describes um the terminology as referring to work that women writers have done in the literary mode uh that since the 18th century we have called the gothic so work produced by women writers in the gothic uh, genre are, are kind of referred to as as female gothic so after she cites uh ratcliffe uh Ellen Morris cites El, uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, and in arguing for the centrality of fear to the experience of women's Gothic, Morris had to resort to Mary Shelley's preface to the 1831 edition of her novel in order to argue for its inclusion in the aesthetics of a women's Gothic. So, um, if you see this argument, which has been put forth by Angela Wright, she says that Ellen Morris had to kind of make use of the preface, the 1831 preface that we discussed in the previous uh, lecture. And that preface has been used by uh, Ellen Morris to include this particular novel, Frankenstein by Shelley, within the category of the female Gothic. And what, what did Mary Shelley say in that 1831 preface? Very briefly, Mar Mary Shelley, I quote, ha said um, she intended Frankenstein to be the kind of ghost story that would curdle the blood and quicken the beatings of the heart. So this kind of, um, you know, uh, suspenseful, uh, spine tingling, um, you know, um, events that she seeks to produce in, in Frankenstein, um, events that would quicken the beatings of the heart are classic uh, components of Gothic uh, fiction. And these elements are, are key to um, kind of labeling Frankenstein as belonging to the category of the female Gothic. Now, Ellen Mower's work, Literary Women, uh, published in 1976, kind of uh, differentiates between different strands of um, female Gothic in an earlier form, uh, characterized by uh, Radcliffe, we have a kind of a, a traveling heroinism. Uh, heroinism is a term that we saw in the previous lecture, and um, it relates to a series of tests, um, moral tests that, uh, uh, that a heroine uh, faces in order to prove herself, in order to, um, you know, grow up into a mature womanhood. So, and, and, and that's kind of a, a, a parallel to the male uh, Bildungs Roman. Um, so, this kind of traveling heroism is part of the female Gothic, um, kind of uh, sketched out by um, Anne Radcliffe. But in, in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, we have a different kind, and uh, it it's closer. This kind of um, Gothic that uh, Mary Shelley produced in Frankenstein is closer to a male Gothic because of its focus on the Promethean overreacher. Um, one who overreaches, one who kind of steps out of the bounds of regulations. And Prometheus, we know that kind of, um, you know, is a figure who stole fire from the gods and gave it to the humans, and for that he was punished. So um, this kind of idea of overreaching is uh, an idea that is uh, embedded in the character of Victor Frankenstein because he overreaches his limits and... Um, gives life to the dead uh, and and for that he has to face a series of consequences he has to lose his um, uh, beloved ones in the story so um so you can see how um you know uh, there is a connection for Frankenstein with the male Gothic, but we can also very very powerfully argue that it belongs to the female Gothic as well now, how do we kind of associate it with the female Gothic? Because there is a kind of a birth myth 
associated with the novel right from the beginning. And um, let's see what that is. Um, Ellen Mowers and later Anne K. Miller have argued that the female author's self-effacement, you know, she, she's kind of um, being very, very modest. Mary Shelley is extremely modest in, in uh, recording the narratives um, in uh, Willow Diodati. Remember the previous lecture where these uh, uh, literati met and discussed ghost stories and had this competition to go uh, to produce a, a ghost story. So in in that uh, account that Mary gives, um, you know, there is a mention of her blank incapability of inventions you know she's not able to produce uh, something which is of um, equal merit with the men so uh, that kind of narrative is, is something that uh, is connected to the female self effacement but when she is uh, challenged when she kind of pushes herself uh, she does write a ghost story and uh, in that ghost story we do get a birth myth uh, and um, you know, and her, she, Mary Shelley herself later called uh, this particular novel as her hideous progeny. So it's, it's as if she's giving birth to um, this novel. She has suffered a, a, a real loss, uh, um, the loss of a child, and she goes on to produce this hideous progeny uh, in Frankenstein. Uh, so all these factors kind of, um, kind of root the story in the birth myth. And, and be kind of connected to the female gothic as well. So this novel's origin became closely associated, we understand with procreation, the idea of giving birth and gestation uh, in that later account of Mary Shelley. And it spoke to her anxieties concerning parentage and her, and her own parenting. So um, she lost a child and she was kind of estranged from her own father. Her mother died uh, when she was born. So there, there is a kind of an, uh, of obsession one can say with this uh, idea of parenting and parentage in uh, Frankenstein. Frankenstein kind of rejects his own child, the, the creature that he produced, and he refuses to be a good father, a, a guide to the child that he created. So that idea of parenting is symbolically uh, discussed in the novel. The still hesitant inclusion of Frankenstein in a tradition of female Gothic is important. So there are critics who would kind of refuse to put Frankenstein within the category of the female Gothic because of its connection with that uh, male Gothic um, underlined by the uh, uh, notion of uh, the overreaching Prometheus. Um, and it, it also speaks to a broader anxiety. Frankenstein uh, uh, speaks to a broader anxiety about how to account for this novel in any gendered account of Gothic literature. So uh, there is an anxiety underlining this novel as to how to kind of place it, whether it is within the female Gothic or, or, or the other kind. Um, so that anxiety makes it complex and richer in terms of um, you know uh, its meanings. Uh, the novel Frankenstein is clearly also discussed um, within the category of male pursuit narratives. You know, Frankenstein pursuing um, the monster that he created in order to wreak vengeance on him. So it, it this novel is categorized as a pursuit uh, narrative within this gothic genre, male pursuit narrative. And um, we have other examples in William Godwin's Caleb Williams, uh, published in 1794. And we have other examples such as Charles Robert Matron's Melmoth, The Wanderer, uh, 1820, and James Hawkes' The Private Memoirs and Confessions of a Justified Sinner in 1824. So what we understand from this kind of critical uh, context to uh, Frankenstein is that there is a, an argument for this novel to be classified as a female gothic and the 1831 preface uh, plays a crucial role there because it talks about um, the idea of uh, giving birth um, and, and um, it's a kind of a literary birth and it's not a normal birth, it's an abnormal birth because as Mary Shelley calls it her hideous progeny just as uh, Frankenstein um, kind of uh, feels um, that uh, the, the progeny that he created is hideous, it's horrid. So that kind of parallel is, is drawn when we kind of categorize it as um, female 
Gothic. Uh, however, there, this novel can also be connected to um, the male Gothic uh, because of this uh, idea of uh, a Promethean figure um, who is connected to uh, Frankenstein because Frankenstein did something which he should not have. He kind of displeased the gods. He displeased nature by giving life um, in this uh, scientific manner and um, and it can also be categorized as a pursuit narrative because it, it kind of pursues things. Um, you know, Frankenstein pursues um, uh, this creature, Robert uh, Walton, this Arctic explorer, pursues a Northwestern Sea Passage, which would make him extremely famous. Uh, so all these, um, you know, trajectories um, are useful uh, in classifying the novel in various ways, but we ultimately understand that uh, the novel is, uh, um, you know, uh, has multiple meanings. It is very, uh, you know, uh, fertile in that regard, and it continues to uh, challenge us. Thank you for watching. I'll continue in the next session.